Well, let's get into the Word of God. John uh, chapter 1 is where we're at. And uh, again, we're making our way through the Gospels. We're harmonizing the Gospels uh, in a series called Written So That You Might Believe. And that's from John 20, 31. It says, these, that's the works and life and all the accounts of Jesus Christ, the Gospels. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name. Uh, That is what it's all about. That's what this church is all about. That's what the Church of the Living God is all about. It is about pointing to Jesus Christ and pointing others to Jesus and for us finding hope and faith in Christ that we would believe and have life in his name. So we've been walking through, uh, we're back at it, this is the second year, second season we've been back at it, and we're walking through uh, the John the Baptist. Just after Jesus grew up and we saw him grow in wisdom and stature, we started back up with John the Baptizer coming out and proclaiming as a herald, making straight the paths in the desert uh, away for the Lord. And, and that's, we're still on that, uh, that theme. So we saw John the Baptist come out and herald that. He was baptizing a baptism of repentance. Uh, and then we saw um, last week we went into uh, the temptation of Jesus. We saw that, well, after John, we saw the baptism of Jesus. Then we see the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness and how Jesus uh, and his faithfulness to God and the mission overcame temptation. And we looked at ways we could overcome temptation as well. And this week we're looking at John uh, taking the opportunity to point out the Messiah to those who were missing him. John points out the Messiah to those who are missing him. Listen, the world all around us is looking for something, but they're not often looking at Jesus. So for you and I, as we go through this this passage of Scripture today, uh, we should find it very important and and as a a motivation and as a drive to go out and point people to Jesus Christ. Uh, That that is our role. And John is there in the same way. People are coming and asking him all kinds of questions and wondering what what he's doing and who he is. And and he sets them straight. Basically, the, the sermon title today is, don't miss the Messiah. In all of these questions and all of these reasonings and all of these wonderings, don't miss the Messiah. There is a journey being had here, and, and John was here to proclaim that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to read the section of Scripture out of John chapter 1, verses 19 through 37 together. Let's pray. Father, we are so excited to be here today uh, to worship you. God, and as we worship you, we, we honor you and give you praise for who you are and what you've done. And God, you rightly deserve all praise and glory. And God, we thank you for the opportunity to look to your word and open your word and read your word. And God, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to be receptive to it. That God, as your spirit is in our midst, that we ask that you would, you would be here to convict us of sin. God, can convince us of truth. And God, help us become more obedient followers of Jesus Christ. God, if there's some way that we are uh, missing the Messiah by our actions or our attitudes or by our philosophies or our religion, God, I, I pray that you would help us to see him clearly today for who he is. And that as we see him, that we would believe and have life in his name. God, as we continue, we ask that you would conform us into the image of the Son, Jesus, so that in all we do, we'd point to him and give him honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're in John chapter 1. Uh, we're going to read verses 19 through 37 together, and then we'll get into that, to that and break that apart. This was John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? He didn't deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. What then? They asked him, Are you Elijah? I am not, he said. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. Who are you then, they asked. We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. So they asked him, why then do you baptize if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? I baptize with water, John answered them. Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He is the one coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. All this happened in Bethany across, uh, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, 
the one you see the Spirit descending on and resting, uh, and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was standing with his two disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. So today we're going to look at, uh, look at ways potentially that we, we miss Jesus or others miss Jesus. But we're going to look at ways that we can point people to Jesus as well uh, through the way we live our lives and herald as, uh, as John did as well. So uh, we're going to look at ways we don't miss Jesus. Number one is this. Don't miss Jesus, number one, because of wide interest in religion or because of a preoccupation with uh, false teaching or false teachers. Uh, and so let's look at this in context. We see the first part of this passage in verses 19 through 28. It says, This was John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? And this is, this is from the Sadducees, right? And, and there's interesting here, you have the Sadducees and the Pharisees who are two different kind of cliques, right? Two different groups, different parties, if you will. But they, in some way, were working together at this moment. We see them because we see the Sadducees who come and who were sent priests and Levites. And then you see that they were actually sent also from the Pharisees in a few minutes. It says that here. So they're both working together because John is out there preaching something. There's something going on, and he's, he's preaching in the wilderness. Like I said this a few weeks ago. He's not in the temples. He's not in the courts. He's not in the town. He is like calling people out of that religious system. Say, come out here and really find life and find truth and hope in the coming Messiah. So the Sadducees had sent Jew, Jews from, or Jews from Jerusalem, that's the Sadducees, sent priests and Levites to him and said, who are you? Now the Sadducees, they were a group of people very, very dedicated to tradition and to the scriptures and everything tying in and working out just as they had thought it should. So they're asking him questions about his identity and, and who are you? And, and the, the, the implication here is, do you think you're the Messiah is really what the question is. And he says in the next thing, he says, I, he didn't deny it, but he confessed. In a lot of translations, it's like he super, super confessed, no, I'm not the Messiah. I want you to know more than anything else, I am not the Messiah. I am not Jesus. But don't miss him. I'm not Jesus. Okay, you're not the Messiah. So then they said, are you Elijah? And certainly there's prophecy in Malachi, and we'll see that in a little bit, where, where Elijah is coming back, or one like Elijah is coming back, and, and he'll, he'll make straight the, the way in the desert. They thought that Elijah would, would have come back and re Elijah reincarnated, come back to be the prophet, uh, the forerunner of the Messiah. He said, no, I'm, I'm not Elijah. I'm not. Are you the prophet? And this is a prophecy out of Deuteronomy uh, from uh, Moses. And this is actually a prophecy about the Messiah. Uh, in, in what it turns out to be, we see later on in the New Testament, uh, the authors there point back to this as being prophetic about the Messiah. So John the Baptist knows this. No, I'm not the prophet that Moses talked about in Deuteronomy. I'm not I'm not the Messiah. He said, no. And who are you then, they asked. We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself? So he has the opportunity to answer now. He says, I, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet said. So it's amazing. John, the baptizer, he doesn't want much credit. and You'll see that as it goes on. He wants to be humble and in the background. He wants to point to Jesus as much as he can. It's about Jesus, not about John. So when he gives the answer, finally, he says, listen, you, you want scripture, you want scriptural evidence, you want to re reconcile this with tradition and with what you think is true. Here it is. I'm the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah prophesied. So he said, Isaiah wrote about this. You should know this stuff. I am that forerunner that Isaiah spoke about. I am the voice. So maybe they're chewing on that a little bit and trying to think, how, okay, how does that work? Is it Elijah? Is it not? I don't really know. But then they said more because they, in the next passage it says they had uh, been sent from the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees, they're, they're more power hungry. And you see that Jesus speak against them often, right, in the New Testament. They were power hungry people and they demanded to know on what authority he had any right to do anything. In fact, when Jesus eventually said, I'm God, what did they do? Power-hungry people killed God, right? They, they put him on the cross. Now, Jesus, we know, didn't just allow himself to be killed. He, he put himself there. He laid his life down for us. But the Pharisees were power-hungry. They want to know what kind of authority. So they said, now they've been sent from the Pharisees. So they also asked, right, when, uh, or why do you then baptize if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? Why are you doing these things that, that should be attributed to someone with power and authority if you're not someone with authority? Here's the problem. He just got done saying, 
I'm the one that Isaiah spoke about. I'm the voice. I'm the one that's here to prepare a way for the Lord. So they're saying, well, he's not the Messiah. He answered, he's not Elijah, and he's not the prophet in Deuteronomy. Who does he think he is? That's what they're, that's what, and they miss the entire thing, right? Why? Because they, they're so preoccupied, they're so focused on a religious system that they miss the, the, the religious, what the, who the religious system's all about. It can be the same for you and I. It can be the same for so many of our friends and our community and our family members. How many people, I mean, we, we have these conversations with folks who say, I, I'm done with religion. I don't want to go to, religion is, is horrible, right? I had a talk this last week. I had a great opportunity to talk. And he's like, a guy said, I, I don't call myself religious. And I said, hey, me either. Me either. I'm a follower of Jesus. Because religion tends to get in the way. Religion tends to puff people up, right? If religion says, hey, if you work it out, if you do enough good, you will be strong enough, you'll be good enough, and, and you'll, just, you'll be on top of your game. And then you can look down on and judge other people. It's a great thing. That's not what Jesus instituted at all. Jesus came to give himself as a ransom for our sins because we're sinful people. We aren't good at all. But religion gets in the way. So you have this whole system of Pharisees and Sadducees, and, and no wonder the Sadducees are always sad, you see. Because they're all about religion. I learned that in like vacation Bible school when I was 11 years old. Libby Baptist Church, there's a shout out to you. The Sadducees are always sad, you see. It's a religion. They're just going through religious motions and trying to keep up with tradition. And all the while, it, we bury our head in the sand and we miss the Messiah. We miss Jesus. Listen, this is very much what we, we just got done talking about in the 23rd Psalm, isn't it? What did we talk about there? I, I, I spoke on this yesterday at, at Norm's uh, Celebration of Life here. In the 23rd Psalm, we say, The Lord is my shepherd, I have what I need, or I shall not want. And, and it was so much as we talked through that, uh, we, Pharisees and Sadducees, what they wanted, they wanted green pastures. They wanted status. They wanted quiet waters. They wanted to look the part and be the part and be around the people and have prestige. But they never, ever wanted the shepherd. So for you and I, as, as we go through this life, listen, maybe you're here today and all you've been a part of is religion. It's just religious work and it's, you're checking off the boxes. Stop. You're missing the Messiah. You're missing what this book and what the prophets have always spoken about and pointed to. And that's Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd. And if we miss him, we have absolutely nothing. Don't miss the Messiah. So the Sadducees were asking their questions, and the Pharisees wanted to know what authority he has. Uh, I just answered that. The authority of Isaiah the prophet, I'm the voice coming. But he answered, in this humble way, he answered this. He says, I baptize with water. He's like, I, I'm nobody. This is just water. Second service, we get, we get to baptize three people at the end of second service. It's going to be awesome. Maybe you get lunch and come back and watch. It's going to be amazing. But it's just water. He says, I baptize with water. Uh, someone stands among you. Again, what are they doing? They're missing the Messiah. Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He's the one coming after me, whose sandal strap I am unworthy to untie. All this happened in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. He says, he says I, I point to Jesus. I'm the one Isaiah was talking about. And that prophecy in Isaiah is Isaiah 40, verse 3. It says, a voice of one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make straight a highway for our God in the desert. John knew that was his, his mission. That was his goal. To smooth out the road, to smooth out the way so people could see Jesus. He, he didn't care about his own ego. I mean, the guy wore camel fur and ate locusts and wild honey, had long hair in the desert. He didn't really care about his ego. He cared about making much of Jesus Christ. So, so what should they have seen? What should they have seen? They saw what they wanted to see, they, and they missed the one who stood among them. Here's some prophecy from Malachi. I'm going to turn there. Uh, in Malachi, it's the last book of the Old Testament. And in Malachi 3.1, it, it says this, see, and I love this word, see. Why do we have to have, have that told to us? Because we miss it, right? We miss the Messiah. Don't miss the Messiah. See, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear away before me. Interesting. He'll clear away before me. Then the Lord, or the, uh, then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. It's like, hey, prepare the way. And then we see in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. 
He says, look, look, see, right, look, I am going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord that, that it comes. So, that, okay, there's, there's reason, right? Oh, are you Elijah, this, this who we're talking about? Well, let's carry on here, though. And, and he will turn hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Okay? Well, then we see in Luke, this, this prophecy to Luke, and this is previous, this is before he's, John the baptizer is born. This is a prophecy to Zechariah, who is a priest in the temple, right? And this prophecy in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, says this, and he, that is John, that's going to be born of Elizabeth, he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to what? To turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. See, the announcement to, to Zechariah and to Elizabeth, ultimately, was John is the fulfillment of Malachi. John is the fulfillment. He is the forerunner. He is the one that's going to pave away and make straight the past. And, and if you're looking, you'd see it. If you're not looking, you're not going to. That's why he says, look, look at this. There's more, though. Jesus sees this as well. In Matthew, uh, you, don't miss him, right? Don't miss the Messiah. Jesus explains this several times, by the way. I'm just pulling one passage out. Jesus, Jesus, when he's talking about John the baptizer being the greatest man who's ever lived, says he is the Elijah that we speak about. But here in Matthew 17, Jesus uh, is having, having a conversation with his disciples in verses 10 uh, through 13. He says, so the disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first before you come? Right? They're still preoccupied on religion, preoccupied on their own translations of text, and, and have nothing to do with what the angel has announced now to, to Zechariah. He says, Elijah is coming and will restore everything, he replied. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they didn't recognize him. See why? They aren't seeing. They're missing what God is doing. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him. This is John, they're talking about John the Baptist. Whatever they pleased to him, in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. It's, oh, oh, okay, we see that. Yeah, John was a forerunner. I mean, and, and crowds are out there. And we said this a couple weeks ago at Jesus' baptism. What happens there, right? The Son comes to be obedient and fulfill all righteousness. The Holy Spirit descends on him at the same time in front of crowds of witnesses. The, the, the heavens open and the Holy Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove, anointing him for service and ministry and power and strength. And at the same time, right, at, right during that time, what happens? The Father from heaven speaks from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son. Here's the stamp of approval on Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. If you couldn't connect the dots, you weren't looking for Jesus. Don't miss the Messiah just because religion has crept in and tradition has crept in, maybe in a, in a harmful way. Number two, don't miss the Messiah as the Lamb of God. As the Lamb of God. John 1, back to 29 to 34. And it's interesting in John, there's, there's a whole week that goes by, and, and it, it starts with, in the next day, then the next day, and the next day. You can go study that and look at it. It's pretty fun. But it says here, the next day. So we just had this day, they came and questioned him. And then the next day, G, uh, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, look, see, don't miss. Look. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. Right? John is not tooting his own horn. He's saying, I, it's, I want to be humbly here to serve God and, and serve the Lord Jesus and point to him always. He says, I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and resting on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me. So he's been revealed to him that the one you see the Spirit descending on and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John, in his ultimate statement at the end of this, at the next day, he says this, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. What is John saying? I didn't miss it. I didn't miss him. I see him, and I, and I hope you don't miss him. Don't miss the Messiah. And see, here, here's the problem. We miss the Messiah when we don't see him as the Lamb of God. We miss the Messiah because we think, 
Well, he should come to rule and to reign right here and right now. And so much of Israel had their hopes set on that. Even though, even though Scripture said otherwise, that, that he would come in a different form, we'll see here in just a minute in Isaiah, they were looking for a powerful political and military leader to take over and to lead and to lead them into freedom and lead them forever. That's what they wanted, that it would be an enduring kingdom, an earthly kingdom, looking for a king, which, you know, it's much like today. And I, I really need us to understand this as we talk about this in this political season and climate we're in in America. I mean, it's election year, right? And in by, by no means am I saying, you know, be done with it, throw it aside. I think we should participate. I think we should be involved. I think we should be well informed and make, make uh, decisions, again, like I said last week, based on our faith. Our, our faith should inform our politics. But if your hope is in your candidate, you're going to be sorely disappointed. If your hope is in a candidate or a king or a president, you have missed the Messiah. It is all about Jesus. And, and so often, it's great. My conversations, try this maybe with your conversations. My conversations with friends or family when it comes to politics, they, they go kind of like probably years ago with your friends and family of politics. Really, really great. And, and, but here's what makes it, like I, here's where I end those conversations, especially as a Christ follower. I say, you know what? In a third world country, I can still follow Jesus. I should follow Jesus the same here as I do over there. It re, you know what? We, if we lose our freedom, if we lose our democracy, you know what? This, this nation is not guaranteed another moment. For the King of kings and Lord of lords is forever. And my faith in him will be an enduring faith. And, and, and I have my faith in him that is an anchor for my soul forever. And that needs to be what guides our lives. Because if, if all of our hope if all of our chips are in one basket with a candidate or a political party or whatever it is, if that's where our hope is, you will miss the Messiah. You will miss Jesus. King Jesus, who wants to reign and rule in your heart and over your family and spread out from there in Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth so that the redemption of Christ, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, can be had by any who believe. Amen? That, that's what we're talking about here. So don't put your hope in a political party. Put your hope in Jesus. Don't miss Jesus. He's the lamb. And he's the lamb that came to be slain for us to give us forgiveness of sin. So uh, I want to look at Isaiah chapter 53. This is where we don't miss the Messiah. What, what did the Messiah come for? He came to lay his life down for us. Isaiah 53, 4 through 7 says this, Yet he himself, the prophecy speaking of the Messiah, bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. But we, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But we, he was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We've all turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. And get, get this imagery right here. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. The Messiah came as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that Lamb of God was the perfect Paschal Lamb sacrifice that died on a cross that I should have died on. Don't miss the Messiah. He's not here to rule over your political party. He's not here to take over the nation and sit on a throne and, and rule it right now. He will. He's coming back, and he will rule. But when Christ came, when John the forerunner said the Messiah is at hand, it was, look, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. They just wanted to be politically aligned. They wanted to be all right. So they were missing it because of their religion, and they were missing it because they thought politically he was a leader in some way, a, a figure that would have taken over and that, and that they would have been in good graces with because of how amazing they were, of course, and how right they were, how correct their position was. All the while, they missed the Messiah. They missed the Messiah. First Peter 1, 18 to 19 says this, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life. Now listen to this. The empty way of life he's talking about is all those times you missed the Messiah. All those times you were far from God. All those times you sinned against God and did your own thing. Those, those ways you desired preference over actual truth. 
He says, you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver and gold. No, the king didn't come to conquer and buy and win and establish. But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. Redemption has only come through the shed blood and offered body of the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And if you haven't seen that, if you haven't understood that, that there's even a need for that, you have missed the Messiah. In Him there is redemption. In Him there is hope. In Him there is joy. In Him there is peace. Don't miss the Lamb. Don't miss the Messiah. And that leads us to number three. Don't miss the Lamb. Or I'm sorry, don't miss the Messiah. But number three, follow Him. Follow Him. Back in our passage in John chapter 1, verses 35 to 37. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, what's the word? Look. See, don't miss the Messiah. Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and guess what? They followed Jesus. They looked, they saw, there's the Messiah, and they followed Jesus. We must follow him. And then we must let others know, let other people that are looking know about the Messiah. I want to read one last passage today out of the book of Acts. If you would turn there in your Bibles with me, I'd appreciate that. Uh, Acts chapter 8. So Acts chapter 8 and a uh, great story of, of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Ver- verse 26 is where we're going to begin. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch of, and a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home reading the prophet Isaiah out loud. He's interested. He wants to know, right? The Spirit of the Lord told Philip, go and join that chariot. So when Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? Oh man, how brave is he, right? We, we, we see someone even interested in Christianity, we're like, Maybe they'll find out what Jesus is and who he is on their own. I don't want to be involved. It's, you know, it's like talking about politics. No, it's not. It's about helping people find the Messiah. Do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, how can I? How convicting this is. How can I unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb is silent before its shears. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For, for his life is taken from the earth. So that's the verse, right? We talked about this a minute ago. Don't miss the Messiah as the Lamb of God. So this is prime. He's reading, he's reading about the Lamb. The eunuch said to Philip, I ask, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about? Himself or someone else? Oh man, I love that kind of question. Tell me all about this. Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. Listen, for you and I, and we'll read, in a minute we'll read something else here, but for you and I, we, we have to start with the fact that he is the Lamb of God. We, we can't miss the Messiah. We can't miss the fact that he is the one who came to redeem all of us by giving his life on a cross by being the perfect lamb sacrifice. And, and why is that necessary? Because we have sinned and separated ourselves from a holy, perfect God. But God in his great love has offered himself through Jesus. That through faith in Christ we might be made whole, that we might be forgiven of our sin and forever changed. Don't miss the Messiah. So he proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he 
baptized him. See, there are so many opportunities all around for you and I to point people to Jesus. And I've said this time and time again. Think, think about even our evangelism, how we evangelize people. We, we say, hey, to our neighbor, hey, you should come to church. What are, we've already set them up for failure often when we do that, by the way. You're like, wait, uh, uh, should I invite my friends to church? Well, well, sure, you should, but there should be a lot more conversation because what you're saying is, I want to invite you to this religious system. It's going to be great. And, and if we invite them to the religious system, what's the potential? What's Satan going to do? He's going to make sure all they see is religion and that they miss the Messiah. I said it for years, even my student ministry. I said, I don't want you to invite kids to church or youth group. I don't want you to invite your friends or family to church or youth group. I want you to invite people to Jesus. I want you to invite people to the Messiah. I want people to know Jesus Christ. And then this builds them up. This shows them a family. This is what encourages them and edifies them and strengthens them in a faith in the Messiah. But if they come here first, oftentimes, and hopefully not at our church, we preach the gospel every week, right? It's hard to miss the Messiah here. But we can come in and Satan wants to blind us and have us distracted in some religious system. And we will miss the Messiah. So don't just invite your friends to church and think you're okay. Invite them to the Messiah. Invite them into conversation about the Lamb of God who was slain for them. And they might come to faith in Christ and decide, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to follow him. So they're traveling on the road. They came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's water. What keeps me from being baptized? The eunuch had a saving faith in Christ at this point. Uh, there's a verse that's in some manuscripts, but it's in, in, in a lot fewer manuscripts that's missing in verse 37. It's, he says, Just belief. He's like, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God is what, what, what we're missing here. And then what happened? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and he baptized him. I, I'm so excited. We had, a couple weeks ago, we had three baptisms out, out in the cemetery park over here, and just an amazing testimony of people saying, I found the Messiah, he changed my life, and I want to proclaim him publicly. I want to let everyone know I'm following him. We've got three being baptized at the end of next service. I, I'm, I'm so excited just for people coming out to say, I want to, I want to let people know all about Jesus the Messiah. It's not a religious thing, right? It's not a religious tradition. It's, it is an ordinance from God that says, follow me, proclaim me publicly. So listen, I, I hope you don't miss the Messiah. Don't let your religion or your expectations get in the way of the Lamb of God and who He is and what He wants to do in your life. Follow Him. Love Him deeply. Let's stand together and pray. <clears throat> Father, we're so thankful again for Your Word and that it's living and active. We're we're so thankful to see that there is power in the name of Jesus and that uh, we should behold the Lamb of God. We should look and see the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God, any pre pre uh, preconceived ideas or notions or preferences that we have made, any tradition that we stand on, any religious system that we are trying to live up to, God, I, I pray you get that out of our way so we could see clearly the Lamb, that we would embrace fully the Shepherd the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. And God, help us to, to abandon whatever we need to abandon in order to follow him and love him fully. And then as we do, proclaim him to the nations. That's starting with those right around us. That we would invite them to meet and see the lamb. We'd invite them to not miss him. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.